Well, good evening. It's good to be out with you again. The singing sounds marvelous. I want to thank our brother for leading us in it in that way. And uh, I just, man, how can I not start off smiling, thinking about the day I've been able to enjoy in God's creation and the beauty of it, but to, to be with Tom and Carolyn and to, to be with them and enjoy a meal together and spend time to get to know them some today. It's just been a great day, and to see all of you all again, and there are several here, and I, I don't want to make it a list of greeting, but I have to make mention of a few people because, and they, they go back, and to see them here, it's just, it's one of those things where you're used to seeing people at a certain place, and then you have your brother like Jeff and his wife come in tonight, and, and they go back to the Madison days, and, and when I'd lost my job years ago, you talk about a comfort, Jeff was that person, and man, I thank him. I could almost lose it over that. He was there in a time of need, and, and boy. And then we got the Roops and the Adamses, my current family, my current church family, and they came down to see me, and, and I told them, sorry, they're getting a repeat. This is one I tried on them a few weeks ago, so, so thank them for putting up with that. And then Jim, my brother-in-law, and his wife, Chris, and they were a big encouragement when I started thinking about preaching, and, and they were counsel in that, and I appreciate them for that in their time, but... But that's it on the list. I don't want to go too, too long on that. But, man, there's some people to thank. And, and you all, Lakeside, thank you for supporting me. As I mentioned today, you guys are a part of our monthly support and the way you take care of us and help. And I just I appreciate you being a part of my work at Lake Street here at Lakeside. So, All right, so this morning we discussed knowing if we were going to heaven in the Bible class. And that was the topic. Really, it was about the plan of salvation. And we went over that in depth, talking about how to start our walk with God. And we likened it, and we talked about being on a journey, talked about being in a plane. And if we are what we should be, a repentant believer, faithful to Jesus in his blood through baptism, then we can trust in him to get us to heaven because he is fully capable of that. But then in the second lesson, we talked about the the, what we do while we're on the path. And we talked about some things that we do at that time. And tonight I want to kind of wrap, off, wrap up this day and think about it a little bit more and the rest of this week to give you a little uh, preview. Tomorrow night we're going to talk about being confident in our walk towards heaven in prayer. And Tuesday night we're going to talk about being confident in our walk towards heaven in works and what we should be doing works in. And then the Wednesday night will be keep it up. Keep going. So if you are interested in that, please come back if you're visiting, and, and we will do that together. But tonight, the ideal is, if I struggle with doubt, can I go to heaven? And I think that's something we all probably at some point, <laughs> I, I remembered to turn the mic on, and now I'm, there we go. If I struggle with doubt, can I go to heaven? And I think this, it's a pretty safe guess. I would say everyone in, a, in here has struggled with doubt at some point. In some way, you've struggled. If you've seriously contemplated your faith and what it means to follow Jesus, there's been a time where you've probably had doubt. And I want to address some of that tonight. You know, the chances are that every once in a while, you're going to come down with some question, some issue, some uncertainty, and some doubt that's going to make you wrestle with your faith. And I'll say that the struggle of doubt is real. I don't want to dismiss that in any way because each person's struggle is, is, is tough. And what happens is it can either drive us away from God or it can be the motivation for us to study the evidence more carefully and that will draw us closer to God. So you're going to have two reactions when you struggle with doubt. The problem is, though, some Christians leave their doubts untreated because they don't want to admit they have it. And that's a, that's a problem as well. Because they think it's wrong to be a real Christian. They must have absolute certainty about everything regarding their faith. And so they're afraid to admit it. I'm afraid to admit it sometimes when I don't think I've got all the answers worked out. And it will eat at you and it will cause you to struggle. So my question is, what doubts are you struggling with today? You know, maybe you doubt that God has really forgiven you. I think we addressed some of that this morning, hopefully. But, but that might be a struggle for you. Or you may wonder whether the Bible really is the word of God. That could be a doubt. 
You might question why God lets people suffer and doubt and struggle with that type of a situation. Or maybe you've been praying for help with a struggle in your life, but so far there has been silence and you're wondering whether God really cares and hears you. I've struggled with that one before. Maybe you have questions about how God created the world or even how he'll end it. And you doubt. And again, these doubts are real. And they're something to not be afraid of. It's how we deal with these doubts that make the difference. So I want to look at a couple of people from the Bible who had doubts. You know, and it's comforting when you look at this. So let's set the scene here a little bit, okay? As we're looking, Jesus is in the thick of his ministry. He's probably been busy at his work for a year to 18 months. During this time, he's healed hundreds of sick people. He's healed disease, leprosy, He's cast out demons. He's even raised the widow's son. He's called his apostles and he's delivered his sermon on the mount. So, you know, at this time, his reputation is growing. It's spreading and people are flocking to him at this time. He's very popular right now. But in the meanwhile, there's another amazing man who has had things not so well for him. And that's John the Baptist. He's been busy at work too before Jesus even started. Let's look at Luke 7 together. Luke 7, 24 through 28. Let's look at the scene that's taking place right here. When the messengers of John had left, he began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out to the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who are splendidly clothed and live in luxury are found in royal palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and one who is more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it's written, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I say to you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John, yet he who is the least in the kingdom of God is greater than than he. Okay, so we know that Isaiah and Malachi prophesied that John would be a forerunner of Christ, coming in the spirit of Elijah. John's own father was told by God and prophesied that John would be the prophet of the Most High. John was definitely a special man with a special mission. He spent a lot of time before Jesus started his work publicly to teach the Israelites about repentance. And he baptized people in the Jordan River to help the people's hearts get ready for Jesus. John had many followers who lived with him in the wilderness. And he was a bold speaker and full of faith in the Lord. You remember, John even got to baptize Jesus. Now we know Jesus didn't sin, so it wasn't for repentance that this had happened. But when John fights the ideal of baptizing Jesus, Jesus tells him, do it because it fulfills all righteousness. That's found in Matthew 3, 13 through 17. But the next day, if you want to go ahead and start turning over to John 1, 29 through 34, Jesus comes to John at the Jordan again. And let's look at what's said here. John 1, 29 through 34. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who has a higher rank than I. For he existed before me. I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained on him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descend and remain upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. Did you catch the other reason Jesus was baptized again in verse 33? I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. 
John was given a sign and told by God the Father that Jesus was the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. And that, that, that convinced John that Jesus is the Son of God. You know, I would say, thinking back on this, that these experiences would certainly have given John confidence and strengthened his faith. You know, there'd be no room for doubt with that kind of a, a sign, right? But what happened soon thereafter? Things turned sour for John. Like I said, John was a bold speaker, and he told it how it was. He preached to Herod Antipas, who was the son of Herod the Great and now the Tetrarch of Galilee. And we know the story. Herod Antipas had divorced his wife and married his brother's wife, and John had told him that this was a sin. John also rebuked Herod for all the evil he had done as a result of this. Herod Antipas put John in prison, and eventually John is executed by beheading over the matter. We don't know for certain how long John was in prison. Some scholars estimate maybe a year, up to a year. But while sitting in a dingy prison cell, reflecting over his life and pending death, this great man, this prophet, this man who heard God the Father speak, even he struggled with some doubt. Yeah, I wonder what he thought about in prison. And we'll soon read that he did have doubts about Jesus. You know, maybe he thought, why am I sitting in prison when I've done what God called me to do? Or maybe he thought, is Jesus really the Messiah? Have I put my faith in the wrong person, right? Maybe some of the questions. Have I really done the right thing? And it's hard to imagine that this great man who has seen and done so many good things to have these thoughts, right? I mean, he heard God declare Jesus is the son and saw the spirit as a dove land on him. So he knew about the prophecies and about himself. He was aware of the following of Jesus and what Jesus was doing, and yet he had doubts. And I'll submit to you, that's what hard times can do to us, and Satan knows it. Difficult times like sitting in a prison can shake our faith. And I hope none of us or ever imprisoned. But how about declining health? Or marriage troubles? Or money hardships? Or rebellious children? Problems in the church? Those things could rock your faith and breed doubt. What about a pandemic? Or government corruption? Or just the blatant attack on God right now in our our world as far as the things with genderism and things like that, the home, and even the Bible. Man, evil's rampant right now, so could not it breed doubt in us? Well, in the midst of John's doubts, what happened to him? And we look over in Luke 7, 18 through 23, if you want to turn there. It says here, the disciples of John reported to him about all these things. Summoning two of his disciples, John sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the expected one, or do we look for someone else? And when the men came to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, Are you the expected one, or do we look for someone else? And at that very time, he cured many people of disease and afflictions and evil spirits, and he gave sight to a man who was blind. And he answered, and he said to them, Go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised upon the poor. The poor have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is he who does not take offense to me. You see here, John, Jesus sends John's disciples back to him with a message of encouragement and admonishment and faithfulness. He bolsters John's faith and discourages his doubts by giving John hard proof of the miracles that are fulfilling prophecy. And then Jesus tells John to essentially not give up. And that's what we have to do. When we have doubts about our faith, when we have fears about this life, we have to be like John and look for truth. I think there are some common misconceptions about doubt and faith. People often mix up faith and feelings. They confuse faith with perpetual spiritual highs. When that high wears off and they start to doubt, if they have any faith at all, it becomes a problem. Doubt creeps in. 
You know, even compare it kind of with the theme of the Psalms. You know, we like to focus on the upbeat Psalms, but 60% of the Psalms are laments and the writer screaming out, God, where are you? Doubt happens. Consider Psalm 22. It starts out by asking, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And who quoted that a thousand years later? Jesus. Not that Jesus had doubt necessarily, but he hurt and felt alone. Believe it or not, faith is allowed to question and doubt. That's usually when it starts getting somewhere. Some people think doubt is unforgivable, but look at Jesus and John the Baptist. Jesus doesn't slam John for his doubts. Jesus sends back evidence of truth to bolster John's faith. And Jesus gives John the greatest of compliments in the midst of his doubt. Jesus was okay with John's doubt, but he encouraged John to do something about it. Look for the truth and not give up. Well, let's talk about another misconception about doubt. And that is some people assume their faith is the absence of doubt. But the opposite of faith is unbelief. And that's a very important distinction. What is unbelief? Generally, in the Bible, unbelief refers to a willful refusal to believe, or it refers to a deliberate decision to disobey God. But that's not what doubt is. To doubt is to be indecisive over an issue. It's where you're hung up between certainty and uncertainty. And I think that happens to us all. You can, still, you can have strong faith and still have some doubts. You really can. And you can be heaven-bound and still express some uncertainty over certain Bible issues. You can be a full-fledged Christian without having to feel like every single question in life has to be absolutely settled. And in fact, it has been said that struggling with God over the issues of life doesn't show a lack of faith. That is faith. Because when you don't know how it all works out, you still believe that God is. Well, let's consider another person in the, the New Testament. Turn over to Mark 19, or Mark 9, I'm sorry, 19. Mark 9, 14 through 24. And you'll recall this is a man who came to Jesus with a son who was demon-possessed to set the stage. But let's read this together. When they came back to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them And some scribes arguing with him. Immediately when the entire crowd saw him, they were amazed and began running up to greet him. And he asked them, what are you discussing with him? And one of the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought you my son possessed with a spirit which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground. And he foams at the mouth and he grinds his teeth and he stiffens out. I told your disciples to cast it out and they could not do it. And he answered them and said, O oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when they saw him immediately, the spirit threw him into a convulsion. And falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. And he asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. It has often thrown him into both fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe, help my unbelief. And the rest of that story is that Jesus heals the boy. The miracle drew a big crowd and his disciples wondered why they could not do it. But the point is, though the father had faith, he also had some doubt. But what remedied his doubt in Jesus? The truth of the miracle. The truth of the miracle got rid of the doubt. So how do we deal with our doubts then? If we're going to deal and overcome doubts in our life, how do we deal with that? And we need to realize that sometimes our doubts are just smoke screens or deflections to hide the real problem. We have to get past it and look at what truly the problem is. And unfortunately, the problem is more to do most of the time with the ideal of won't believe as opposed to can't believe. We have to believe the truth. 
You know, a lot of people won't believe because they don't want to give up a certain aspect of their lifestyle. But since you all are here today worshiping the Lord and learning from his word, I'm going to assume you aren't like those folks because you want to believe, and I commend you for that. You're here on a Sunday night. You know, there's a lot of the world out there that's not, so I commend you for that. But, you know, we still have doubts. But I want to now look at things we can do which will reinforce our faith and to drive away doubts. So we've looked at the problem of what doubt does, but now I want to look at how do we fix it? What's, the, what's some solutions to it? What's some suggestions to it? And I want to first say that we need to grow our faith and turn to Jesus. We need to do exactly what John the Baptist did. And the father of the demon-possessed boy, they went to Jesus. He's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. And the only way to expel doubt and to grow faith is to read and study his word in the Bible. Jesus is the light of the world, and he will shed light on your doubt and drive it away. But you have to dig into his word. Another suggestion to work against doubt is to gather with faith-building people. Exactly what we're doing tonight. You have to be with people of faith in order to be a person of faith. Be a Christian with Christians for studies, for leisure activities, be with Christians to work and to serve others. Make Christians your best friends. John sent his disciples and friends to his cousin Jesus to build up their faith. Thirdly, put faith-building materials into your mind. Sermons, books, music that builds a strong motivation of faith that teach the nature of God. You know, Things that deal intelligently with what is critics of faith. Let it strengthen you. Let it bolster you. You know, people have the tools to help one another to develop your faith. And it will expel doubts. Again, go back to that mind. What made the Father remember? It was a truth about the miracle. When we have the truth of God's word put before us, it will cover those doubts and grow our faith. John sought out the truth, and Jesus backed it up with evidence of his teaching. You know, go back and tell John what you saw. When people around us in this world are having doubts, you need to give them the truth. And fourth, we need to pray. You know, that's what the Father did in that scenario. He asked Jesus to increase his faith. Pray about your doubts. And the Lord will see you through them. And what you have to do is you have to open up your eyes broad enough to see that he may be seeing you through them by the help of one of your brothers and sisters. He will take care and provide for us if we'll let him. So in conclusion about this, doubt, doubt and faith can coexist. Okay, if you have some doubts, can you still go to heaven? I say yes. Absolutely yes. Yes, 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 you can. But one very important implication of our study today is that if you doubt and you have your faith, it can coexist, but people that don't fully resolve to have those two things will not have an authentic faith that will get them through it. You have to help this go together. You know, we can make choices to believe and ask God to help us with our unbeliefs. We can make choices to study. We can make choices to be with people. But we have to be genuine about it. You know, doubt can produce some positive side effects. You know, uh, a quote from a guy named Gary Parker in the book The Gift of Doubt wrote, If faith never encounters doubt... If truth never struggles with error, if good never, never battles with evil, how can faith know its own power? In my own pilgrimage, if I have to choose between a faith that has stared doubt in the eye and made it blink, or a naive faith that has never known the fringe, the firing line of doubt, I will choose the former every time. We have to be tried. You know, you ask people, you know, that 
go to the gym and work out and try to exercise. They don't keep lifting the small weights. They keep testing themselves. They add more weight. And they set that hurdle. And when they get past that hurdle, they set another one. You know what? We need to look at our doubts and we need to try them and push them and make sure we know the power that's in our faith through the Lord. You know, if your faith really is in love and mercy and grace of God that he's shown us through Jesus Christ, or are you trusting in your own goodness? Or the fact that you show up to church most every Sunday? You're on the losing end of the stick if you're on that last one. You know, we have to remember. Sorry. As the old proverb says, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. We talked about that today. It doesn't mean that you become the superstar overnight and doing things for your brothers and sisters. But this week, do one thing more than you did last week. If it's sending cards, send one card this week. If it's making a phone call, make one phone call. If it's stopping by someone and seeing them once this week, stop by and see them once this week. Clear your calendar for the gospel meeting this week at night. If you've missed in past times, make this one the time, not because it's me, but just make this one the time that's going to be different and you're going to show up every night. Put some truth into the doubt that you struggle with. And remember, ultimately we have to start out this journey by doing what faith would do, believing. In other words, we have to do what Jesus says. And you'll experience the validity of your faith and you'll expel doubts. You know, another quote in an, another book, Fancy, uh, Philip Yancey in Reaching for the Invisible God said, what can you expect to find in, in the title of his book? Doubt is a skeleton in the closet of faith and I know no better way to treat a skeleton than to bring it out in the open and expose it for what it is. Not something to hide or fear, but a hard structure on which living tissue may grow. You know, take those doubts out and look at them and expose them to the truth of God's word and see where that doubt changes and goes away. Doubts can be that skeleton on which you build your faith. And the truth of God's word is what will get you past them. It's what will put some substance behind them. You know, you all have been patient tonight, and I thank you for that. And if you want to uh, be ready to sing here in just a minute, we're going to have an opportunity for those that need to possibly obey the gospel to come forward and put on Jesus in baptism, which we, we've talked about this morning. But we also have a, a chance now to let each other know if we struggle with doubts as part of this body. Get it out of that closet and put it out here so that people can be praying and encouraging you and giving you the truth of God's word to be able to dispel that doubt that you're struggling with. So the challenge tonight in leaving this lesson is let the action of our faith outweigh our doubts. Seek truth, study, be with others who will build your faith and pray for the Lord to help you with your doubts. And you will take a step forward. And maybe tomorrow you'll take two, and the next day three. And you just keep step by step growing those things, building that faith, so that when the doubts of life come and the storms come, which they will, you'll be ready to stand confidently on the Lord who's given his son to die for us and save us. Tonight, if you need anything, come and stand. Sing while we stand and sing.